Hello, and welcome everyone. I'm Josh, this is Moto Tribe, and that is the Moto Guzzi MGX21 Flying Fortress. It's big, it's mean, it's a touring machine. Have the Italians pulled it off? Have they built a bagger to capture the American market? Obviously with the bags and the swoopy lines, that's what they were going for, but does it work in the real world? Everywhere else. There's no ways we could start anywhere other than the looks. It has a Darth Vader on a Sunday cruise kind of look about it. It is very distinctive. People stop and stare. They want to take photos. They ask questions. Every time we went to go fill up, people just had to know what is this thing. There's tons of real carbon fiber everywhere, adding to this menacing presence. And with that bat wing fairing up front, it gives it a very traditional bagger look. And with black being your only color option, those red accents can really pop. A big 21 inch front wheel, hence MGX21, with a carbon rim gives it a commanding stance. And those bags or panniers with the cool looking swooping LED lights have an obvious American influence, but with an unmistakable Italian flair. Getting to faraway places usually means starting at the close by places. Inevitably, you'll find yourself having to maneuver this behemoth around town. How does the Flying Fortress deal with it? Well, starting with the seat, it's beautifully padded and plush. We could easily spend hours in the saddle with no numb bum feeling at all. It is a bit wide and splays your legs a tad, but not terribly so. Plus, at 740 mils, you're not really struggling to reach the ground. This is great because confidence on this bike is everything. The mirrors are excellently positioned with tons of adjustability. You can see behind yourself perfectly. No crazy vibrations at highway speed, none of that. It has a hydraulic clutch with an adjustable lever and it does get pretty heavy. I have a two finger clutch style and I had to adopt to a four finger operation, but after that it got a little bit easier. The six speed gearbox might come across as clunky, but personally I enjoy the reassuring thunk you get when gearing up to know you successfully hooked a gear. The same thing when gearing down, it never really felt like too much effort. Neutral can be a bit tricky to find at times, but not impossible. Go from second, give it a light tap down, and you should be okay. None of us hit a false neutral even once, so overall the gearbox gets a good mark from us. This bike is magnificent on the move, but once getting to slow speeds, it all goes a little bit pear-shaped. There's no getting around its heft, so tight parking lot maneuvers can get a bit hairy. It has a big turning circle and without a reverse gear, backing it in and out of spots feels like leg day at the gym. An experienced rider will manage but still has to pay attention. Short riders will definitely struggle. The headlights are quite impressive actually. For nighttime riding, the low beams work just great and the brights do a super job of illuminating the road, not just way up ahead but also off to the sides. There's a whole bunch of options for daytime running lights too. It's almost as if they're encouraging a spot of late night riding. And it's also worth mentioning, the brake lights and rear indicators are very visible. The kickstand is easy to find, but getting the bike hoisted off its side can be a bit of a task, especially if the ground is a bit uneven. It doesn't lean too far over, so getting her in the garage or a parking spot isn't an issue. Ergonomics is the most fascinating aspect of this bike. The foot pegs are incredibly well placed that your feet find them so instinctively, even if you aren't used to riding cruisers. Your legs aren't too far forward, so you never feel too cramped up. Even our taller riders found the legroom more than sufficient. The reach to the bar, however, feels a bit far, placing you in a forward tilt that, whilst not uncomfortable, feels weirdly committed and almost racy. We spent many hours in the seat, and the one thing we all noticed is a pinch between the shoulder blades. This can get tiring on very long journeys of, let's say, 300 plus Ks. The standard screen is very love-hate. It looks spectacular and suits the looks of this bike to a T. The downside is it's pretty low, so protection is compromised. It does a great job of keeping the wind off of your chest without forcing it onto your helmet. This means your head is in smooth, clean air like it would be on a naked bike. Consider wearing your quietest helmet and a good set of plugs. Is all this ideal for touring? Probably not. Bottom line, Keep it at legal speeds and you'll be happy.
If you're around two meters tall, like our tallest rider, you will have more wind on your chest, making your life a little bit harder and the ride slightly more uncomfortable. Switch gear is solid with a good tactile feel, nothing flimsy about it. On the left, you have the bright switch, a big radio mute button, joystick for volume and Bluetooth operation, cruise control toggle, indicators, Bluetooth pairing button, and the loudest horn I've ever heard in a bike. On the right, you have a switch for lighting options, hazards, a mode toggle that cycles through trip info, confusing I know, a kill switch, and the starter. The dash has a very clean and minimal look, which I think is pretty stylish. The two massive dials displaying speed and radio or music info on the left. The right dial shows revs on the outside ring and in the center you get a dot matrix display showing ambient temp, speed readout, fuel gauge, riding mode, trip info and gear position. Would a big TFT screen be better? On this bike, I'd say no. In terms of tech, the Flying Fortress is ride by wire, which means you get traction control with three levels of adjustment or it can be turned off. It also has ABS, Bluetooth connectivity and a stereo system to listen to some tunes or the radio. Unfortunately, above 60 kph, you won't be able to hear much of it due to the increased wind noise. You also get three rider modes. You change by thumbing the starter while the bike is running, all with Italian names because why not? Turismo is for touring. Eases the throttle and engine braking for some relaxed cruising. Works great for two-up riding. Pioggia. Pioggia. Rain mode, I guess. Very lazy throttle response, which works nicely in heavy traffic. And finally, my favorite, Veloce, or sports mode. Great throttle response, good engine brake, and it gets the best out of this fantastic engine. Probably the mode you'll use the most. It must be said, however, no reverse gear and no heated grips feel like obvious features missing from this bike. As previously mentioned, you can connect your phone via Bluetooth to play music through the speakers and also for turn-by-turn -turn navigation. Another nice feature is a USB port, which is always handy to keep your devices charged on long trips. We just had a tough time keeping that little flap closed. This is an important one. How does the Flying Fortress deal with carrying a pillion? Starting with the passenger seat, it's soft, comfy and wide. Lovely. Without any grab handles or backrest, your passenger will have to hang on to you, but that is by no means a deal breaker. Our resident pillion tester, Marge, scores the MGX21 quite high for comfort. The foot pegs are placed very comfortably for all day riding. The bags don't get in the way, and it's pretty easy to mount and dismount with it being so low to the ground. Crank up the preload, pop her in Turismo, or even Veloce, and the Flying Fortress will devour the miles with you and the missus without flinching. The bags have a capacity of around 58 liters, but since we didn't fill it with water, that measurement means little to us. What we can tell you is that a small backpack will fit in with a squeeze. Luckily, there's two bags. It's best used for day trip items, a bottle of water, jacket liner, hat, snack, so on. Maybe even a pair of shoes or spare underwear for a night in Clarence. The tank holds 20.5 liters and returned 5.5 liters per 100 Ks in Turismo and 6.4 in Veloce mode. Interestingly, the fuel filler cap detaches completely, so you're left just kind of holding it in your hand while filling it up. It's kind of weird. Anyway, we managed a comfortable 260Ks between fill-ups before the low fuel light came on, but theoretically you can get 340Ks off a tank. Just don't get caught out because pushing this home would suck. So what does the big 1400cc V-twin feel like out on the open road? Setting off, the bike pulls itself along with authority. 120 Newton meters of shaft driven torque will do that. Instead of short shifting, stretch the revs out and you're rewarded with a smile inducing grunt that gets better and better with each gear change. Once you've reached cruising speed, the engine is so creamy smooth, you almost zone out, focusing only on the road and the scenery, cruising along without a care in the world. In Veloce mode especially, 6th gear acceleration is fantastic for quick overtakes where the throttle has just the right amount of snappiness. It doesn't encourage hooligan behavior, but it also doesn't shy away when asked. At traffic lights, it runs a bit hot and rocks from side to side, like it's eager to get going again. This engine doesn't rev, it pulses like a heartbeat, like it's alive. I now fully understand what people mean when they say these bikes have character. The Euro 4 compliant exhaust is a bit muted, but by no means quiet. It has a lovely burble at idle that I really enjoyed. And once you start climbing through the rev range, it sounds like an excited Rottweiler puppy chewing on a slipper. Take a listen.
brakes are ridiculously good, much better than the weight of this bike would lead you to believe. These massive Brembo's up front and even in the rear work fantastically. Good initial bite and a strong progressive feel. Nice. The handling is where this bike shows its compromise. The heavy front end coupled with the 21 inch front wheel means you're constantly muscling the bike around corners. Initial turning is good with its wide bars, but keeping it in line takes a bit more effort. This is a physical activity that might tire you out on tight technical twisties. The forks are non-adjustable and they do dive quite a bit. The rear has remote preload adjustment which helps soak up some bumps and make two-up riding easier, but with little travel it won't appreciate rough roads too much. So instead of counter steering the traditional way, hang your body off of it a bit, give her a little bit more physical activity and she will reward you with some really good handling. Crosswinds also become a factor with the big carbon rim out front acting like a sail, pushing the front end around. You have to have your wits about you when she starts getting flighty. Weighing in at 355 kilos wet, it's a hefty one, no doubt about it. This is only really evident when heaving it off the kickstand or very slow speed maneuvering. Anything above 20 kph, it's perfectly manageable. That just comes with the territory with a bike like this. The bike was fitted with the Dunlop Elite 3s and we did a lot of mixed riding with it, from some very light off-roading to sketchy back roads and at no point did we feel they weren't up to the task. Highways, however, is where these tires work best. Is this the bike to have if you could only have one? When we went to pick the bike up from IMI, we were informed that this is only one of six flying fortresses in Africa. How's that for exclusivity? With that said, we have a feeling that the kind of person buying this definitely owns more than one bike. A good thing too, because this is definitely an occasion bike. It's not going to work everywhere in every situation. But that one weekend getaway where it's just you and the open road, few bikes will give you that special feeling like the Goodsy does. These are the bikes the MGX21 will no doubt be compared to. But if you ask me, to compare this bike is to miss the point of it. So when we collected this bike from IMI, we thought we had it summed up, but we were wrong. This bike is not a collection of specs, it's not even a touring bike as such. What it is, is a complete mindset change. Cruising, looking good, that's what this bike was built to do. It's kind of like a giant Vespa, and I do mean that in the best way possible. The style, character, passion, soul, all those other lazy ways to describe Italian bikes. It's really all here. Yes, it does have flaws, but so does the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and people still line up to go see that. So I really don't see it as a bad thing. It is a rolling piece of art, it's a statement everywhere you go, and I really, really like it. If you get the opportunity, go test ride it, go experience it for yourself, because I'm pretty sure you'll leave the whole experience feeling kind of the same way we do. A big thank you to IMI Joburg for trusting us with their incredibly rare, beautiful, amazing machine. We really, really appreciate it, guys. I'm Josh from Motor Tribe. Thanks for watching.